Hi, this is Elliot from EO Nutrition and today we're going to be looking at the mechanisms behind how non-native electromagnetic frequencies such as the radiation coming from your mobile phone or your Wi-Fi router could potentially destroy how cells are working. Okay, so you may have heard that mobile phones cause cancer or that Wi-Fi can cause fertility, infertility. Well, there's actually loads of research showing very strong correlations, potential causal links between these radiation sources and various different types of diseases and also disease processes. So this video doesn't really have time to go through all of the research studies. And in fact, that's, done be that's been done before really quite well. And what I will do is I will link to those papers in the show notes. But in fact, what we're going to do in this video is examine some of the mechanisms by which EMF, EMF is affecting cells on a non-thermal level, which means that it's not heating cells up per se. What it's actually doing is it's activating a cascade of other processes which essentially operate on a biochemical mechanism to destroy the cell. So hopefully at the end of the video, you will understand why mobile phones, why Wi-Fi routers, and why other kinds of electromagnetic radiation is probably something that you want to avoid as best as possible and really do your best to stay away from. So the way that we can understand how cells are affected by this radiation is actually looking at calcium. Okay, so calcium is typically what people associate with strong bones or strong teeth. But calcium is not only important for the structure of the body, it's also highly important on a biochemical level inside the cells. So calcium is needed for several different things. And when it gets into the cell, you can think of it as almost like an excitatory stimulus it activates things. So it's involved in signal transduction and in the synthesis of neurotransmitters. It's involved in the contraction of muscles. Um, it's a cofactor for several different enzymes. And it's also, also really stimulating for the mitochondria. And so ordinarily, um, before calcium can actually do all of these things, it needs to be inside cells. And ordinarily, the concentration of calcium is much, much higher outside of the cell than it is inside. And when the time is right, so when something needs to happen, um, the cells are essentially gonna allow calcium to flood in, okay? And the way that they do that is via these doorways, you can think of, they're channels or certain kind of protein which is located on the on the plasma membrane of the cell and this is called a voltage gated calcium channel okay so it's a channel protein which essentially is allowing calcium ions to flow from the outside of the cell into the cell okay and the reason it's called voltage gated is because it actually has a voltage sensor on it and that voltage sensor is extremely uh, sensitive to the movement of ions into the local electromagnetic environment. Now these voltage-gated calcium channels, they're essentially found in the membrane of certain excitable cells. So they're found on the membrane of muscle cells, of glial cells, and of neurons. We want to keep a very tight control over, the, over this system. And this is where EMF comes in, okay? So EMF, um, if you read any of the papers, papers by Dr. Martin Paul or Professor Martin Paul, um, it seems that one of the mechanisms by which EMF is causing damage to cells is actually via acting on these voltage-gated calcium channels. And what you're essentially getting is an influx of calcium when it shouldn't necessarily happen and when the cells can't necessarily deal with that. So voltage-gated calcium channels are activated by specific frequencies of EMF. And there's several proposed models for how this actually works. One of them involves something called calcium cyclotron resonance, whereby um, specific frequencies are essentially altering the biophysical properties of calcium ions. 
So it's affecting the way that they spin or rotate or oscillate. And certain frequencies actually resonate with calcium ions. And this is potentially feeding calcium through the channels. Okay, so when calcium floods into the cytoplasm, it subsequently affects many different organelles. Okay, so it can get into the mitochondria. When it gets into the mitochondria, it causes an overload of calcium, and this can lead to swelling and rupture of the outer membrane. It can also cause mitochondrial dysfunction, excessive reactive oxygen species, and subsequently cause the cell to die. When it gets into the nucleus, it modulates gene transcription, and this essentially promotes um, cell death as well. Now, it's also affecting various proteins, so it, it basically regulates a phosphorylation of, of proteins and it's activating certain enzymes. There's enzymes called phospholipases and proteases, and these are involved in basically damaging membranes, proteins, cytoskeleton, and it can cause damage to the DNA as well. Excessive calcium efflux also can result in a condition called excitotoxicity. And this is essentially where there's rapid neural firing and it's involving a neurotransmitter called glutamate. So the main, main operating mechanism of excessive calcium is actually related to extensive levels of oxidative stress. And some of the downstream effects of this is a radical shift in the neuroendocrine system and how the balance of hormones are completely changed. When you have excessive calcium signaling in the hypothalamic pituitary axis, you can actually end up with higher levels of a hormone called ACTH. Now, ACTH is responsible for directing the adrenal glands to secrete um, stress hormones like cortisol. Okay, so short-term exposure in the research actually results in higher levels of stress hormones. However, when there is a longer-term exposure to EMF, it actually causes a depression or an exhaustion in the endocrine secretion. Okay, so someone can have really high levels of stress hormones, which are potentially mediated by EMF exposure. But when this goes on for a long enough time, then it can actually cause some which might mimic adrenal fatigue, whereby they, their, their stress hormones are actually flatlined. Another added effect of calcium efflux is actually involving an endogenous substance called nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is basically, it can act as a neurotransmitter or as a hormone. And in the circulatory system, it's very important as a vasodilator, meaning that it can dilate blood vessels. So for maintaining healthy blood flow, nitric oxide is important. However, when you have too much nitric oxide, this is not a good thing, okay? So when you have excessive calcium efflux, what actually happens is that Certain enzymes, which are calcium or calmodulin dependent, um, these are called neuronal nitric oxide synthase and endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And so what this calcium signaling is doing is activating these enzymes. And so what you end up with is a higher level of nitric oxide. Now nitric oxide can react with superoxide to form something called peroxynitrite. And now this is a potent oxidant. And when you have high levels of peroxynitrite in something called the peroxynitrite cascade, this can go on to make free radicals such as the hydroxyl radical, which is really damaging to anything that it comes into contact with. Furthermore, nitric oxide actually can bind with a uh, a section of the mitochondria, it's a complex called cytochrome C oxidase. Now, when you have nitric oxide bound to this cytochrome C oxidase, it actually prevents the electron transport chain from working properly. So, 
The electron transport chain is where you are feeding electrons through the complexes in the mitochondria to essentially make ATP. And when you have excessive levels of nitric oxide, this process is halted. Okay, so what this means is that you need to make more cytochrome C oxidase to restore mitochondrial function. Nitric oxide also can bind to certain enzymes in the cytochrome P450 family. These are responsible for steroidogenesis. They're, they're involved in vitamin, vitamin D metabolism and in cellular detoxification. And so it's possible that with elevated nitric oxide, you may actually have a reduced ability to synthesize steroids such as the testosterone or progesterone or estrogen. Ultimately, this peroxynitrite cascade is capable of utterly destroying the nervous system and the cells it's coming into contact with causing cell damage, oxidative stress, membrane damage, and neuroinflammation. And now you might be thinking that a little bit of oxidative stress is not that much of a problem because we have our own internal antioxidant systems to be able to deal with that. Well, unfortunately, it also turns out that EMF has been shown to deplete our intracellular antioxidants. One of those is called glutathione. And animal studies have actually shown that 900 megahertz EMF, similar to something you would find from a mobile phone, when they're exposed to that for two hours a day, particularly the lymphoid organs, there was a significant decrease in glutathione peroxidase, which is an enzyme involved in the glutathione system. There was also reduced um, or a decreased level of reduced glutathione and a significant lipid peroxidation in all lymphoid organs. There is another enzyme called catalase. Catalase is also decreased in EMF exposure. Okay, Another enzyme called superoxide dismutase. This is extremely important and EMF also seems to deplete this in the brain. Okay, so interestingly, many of these effects can actually be mitigated by the use of calcium channel blockers um, in animal studies. So there have been several studies showing that when you administer these drugs, these calcium channel blockers, they are essentially mitigating many of the damaging effects of EMF. And this fact supports the notion that much of the damage coming from the EMFs is actually mediated via these calcium channels. So what does this all essentially mean? Well, these mechanisms are bypassing nutrition. You can be doing everything right in your diet and still not see the results that you're hoping for. You need to understand that the human body has adapted to tolerating certain kinds of food. Even if they're not necessarily optimal, we can do something with them. It's also adapted to the natural EMF environment on, on planet Earth. But unfortunately, it has no known adaptation or even defense against artificial EMFs. You need to avoid this, okay? So I have many clients who actually come to me, they're taking a bunch of supplements, they're following a really clean diet and yet are still really sick. When I ask about this stuff, they're usually prolific users of technology. Now, if you've been following Jack Cruz's work over the years, he's been warning about this several times and it seems that there is such a focus on which kind of diet to eat and what kind of supplements that you must take. And people are completely avoiding the fact that probably the biggest factor di disrupting human health in today's world is likely related to our exposure to electronic devices. So the take home message from this video is essentially food is only one input. Okay, food is one input and our ability to metabolize food, our ability to deal with the electrons coming from food is also influenced by our exposure to electromagnetic frequencies. If you are doing all of the things right in your diet but you have not fixed your EMF environment, 
you need to find ways to avoid exposure. You need to find ways to mitigate this effect because diet alone is likely not going to be sufficient to provide you any um, sustainable relief in terms of healing. So if you like this video or you found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my page. If you think other people will be interested, share it. That would be great. You can find me at eonutrition.co.uk. Uh, I'm also on Facebook as eonutrition. Thank you and I will see you next time.